And as you are, let me invite you to turn uh, with me, if you would, to uh, Isaiah chapter 35. We are in the second of our uh, fruits of the spirits that we're kind of working through, and we're doing them in the order in which they appear uh, in the Galatians passage. So last week, we, we introduced the, the topic with that kind of cornerstone theme of love. And this week, we're going to build on that with uh, the fruit of joy. Uh, that grows out of that relationship with love. And we're going to look at it through the lens of the experience of the Old Testament Hebrews, uh, who were going through at this, at this season of their life, and I'll say more about this in a minute, but they're going through a pretty tough time. And still in the midst of that tough time, they experienced uh, a measure of joy. And uh, the prophet Isaiah writes to them, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. So strengthen the weak hands and meek firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong and fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with recompense, he will come and save you. And the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, and the lame man shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute shall sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert, the burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water, and the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It belongs to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This is the word of the Lord, my friends. Thanks be to God indeed. Would you pray with me? Let's pray together. Father, we ask you to uh, minister to us this morning by the presence and the person and the anointed power of your Holy Spirit. As we ponder these words from Isaiah's prophecy, Lord, would you uh, drill them down deep in our spirits so that we might be a people in the way that we live each day that looks like this picture, a people who live in joy, authentic, genuine, life-changing joy, Lord. Because we ask it all in the precious and strong name of Jesus. Amen. How many of you ever played the game, either with friends or maybe as a a team-building exercise at work, uh, Two Truths and a Lie? Any of you played that game? It's kind of a fun game. So the... (laughs) If you've never played it before, it's the object is you have a group of people, and it's really good for getting to know new people because you learn a little something about them. And the, the object of the game is you ask each person to come up with things about them, uh, preferably things that other folks in the room might not know about them, two of which have to be true and one of which has to be false. And then they share one at a time, and the group tries to guess which one of the Three is the lie, which is the, which is the true, true statements and which one is the lie. And it's kind of fun. But it's also, if you've ever played it, you know it can be really hard to figure out which one is the lie, right? Uh, especially if you don't know the people in the room very well and you don't know much about their story and you're just getting to know them. That's why it's a good team building exercise. Uh, but, it, but, but sitting there and listening carefully and trying to discern what might be true and what might not be true about them, is, it can be a challenging thing and we can get kind of mixed up. And unfortunately, the same sort of thing happens when it comes to uh, our engagement with and interpretation of Scripture. Sometimes we... We, we muddle the waters a little bit by thinking that some things that we hear in, in the culture and in popular theology, as I call it, pop theology, is actually what the Bible says, when in fact it's not. But we think it's true, but it's not. Like, for example, God helps those who help themselves. No, he does not. In fact, the scripture says quite poignantly, he helps those who cannot help themselves. He rescues the weak. He lifts up the downtrodden. He binds up the wounds of the broken heart, right? 
Or, money is the root of all evil. No, it is not. That's not what the Scripture says. Scripture says the love of money is the source of all kinds of evil, right? It's not that money in and of itself has a moral virtue. It's what we do with it and how we relate to it that makes all the difference in the world, right? But we kind of come down to this, this pop theology, money is the root of all evil. Or this one, all things work together for good. No, they do not. Look at history. Look at what happens to people. All things do not work together for good. What the Bible actually says is that in all things, God is working together to bring about good for those who love him and are called by his name. God still brings good out of circumstances that are not good. Somebody say amen. amen. But people will often quote that saying, oh, well, you know, all things work together for good. No, they do not. Or this one, you're confined only by the walls you build yourself. Tell that to Paul and his companions <laughs> when they were praying and saying, God, we want to go in this direction. And he says, and we, we determined that the Holy Spirit had prevented us, had closed that door, and so we ended up going in a different direction. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes, that is in Scripture. It is true. But we often misquote and misunderstand it as sort of a motivational speech that should be on a poster somewhere, right? In an office to, 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 to build the, the, the morale of the, of the employees. In fact, when you read it in this context, what Paul is talking about is the experience of suffering and having a lot and having a little, and it doesn't matter where he is in life or how good or bad his circumstances are in those moments, particularly the difficult moments, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me but we tend to associate it only with success and victory and fame and fortune. Or the Lord will never give you more than you can handle. Really? Because sometimes I felt like it's more than I can handle. In fact, what the scripture says is he will not let you be tempted beyond what you were able to endure and will give you the means of grace in those moments of temptation. It's not that he won't sometimes allow you to go through very difficult seasons in your life that you feel like, I can't handle this. This is more than I can handle. The, the truth of the matter is that in sort of pop theology, we, we assume these things, because they get repeated over and over again, we, we assume they are biblical when they are not. They're not what the Scripture says. And in a similar way, it may not be as, as popular or as meme-worthy as some of these are, but we, we treat joy in the same way. And we Christians have tended to draw this sharp distinction between happiness and joy, whereas uh, happiness is contingent upon our circumstances and joy is transcendent of them. And we've sort of, we've sort of separated the two, and we've relegated the experience of joy to a synonym basically for stoic Contentment. Things are terrible in my life, but I still have joy. But we don't smile when we say that. The only problem with that is that it's not what the Bible says about joy. The Bible does not describe joy as stoic contentment or anything closely approximating that. In fact, quite the opposite. The biblical understanding of joy, both in the Old Testament Hebrew and in the New Testament Greek, is quite demonstrative. It is ecstatic. It is joyful. It is gaiety. It is celebratory. It is party. It is dancing. It is hooting and hollering. That's what the, that's what the words in the scriptures actually point to, is a much lighter, a much more happy, by the way we define it, celebratory spirit. That's how the scripture defines joy. That's what the Bible actually says about joy. That joy is a party. Say that with me. Joy is a party, right? It, it's the, it's the, the feeling, I, I must imagine, it's the feeling that the Olympic athletes have on the night of the opening ceremonies after all those years of work and hard effort, right? and the time and the training they put in, and then finally they are there amidst all the celebration. 
That must be a night of incredible joy for those athletes to have finally made it to that point, right? It's the experience you have on your wedding day or when a child is born to you and, and your, your, your spirit is just so full of joy. At least I hope that was your experience on your wedding day or when you had children. You, you, you would hope that that would be a day where you're just, uh, just it's filled to overflowing, that your heart is full of joy. It's the deep satisfaction of a, of a job well done or creating something beautiful or tasty. And you take that first bite and you're like, mmm, mmm, that's good. Right? That's the, 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 the reflection of, 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 of the creator God on the days of creation when God would create a part of the created order and would step back and say, mmm, 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 now that's good. That's joy. Right? The experience of co-creating with him and doing things with God. And celebrating our creative nature. Biblical joy is sitting on your back porch with a cup of tea and the air is filled with birdsong and your spirit just lifts. And there's something about it that fills you full of joy. It's the experience of a, of a, of a fine, delicious meal that you share with friends or family and there's laughter and great conversation around your table. And then when the evening comes to a close, you're like, man, that was great. That was really fun. Those are the, the images, the experiences that we have that, that, that get us more in the realm of what actual biblical joy looks like. And it's the experience that the prophet Isaiah is sort of foreshadowing prophetically as the Lord inspired him to paint this beautiful picture for the Israelites in the midst of a very difficult situation. They were in exile. They had been forcibly removed from their homeland and carried off against their will to Babylon, modern-day Iraq. And they were stuck there. But God promised them that their stuckness wouldn't last forever. Morning may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. And so he paints this picture, this beautiful poetic picture of their restoration, of their renewal, of their experience of joy. Did you notice, as I read through that text, how often the word joy just kept coming into it? Because God is trying to describe for them in picturesque form through the prophet what it's going to feel like when they return, what it's going to be like in their experience. And he uses this great language. The wilderness, the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. Strengthen the weak hands. Make firm the feeble knees. Say to those with anxious hearts, fear not, be strong. The eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf unstopped. There shall be the lame man leaping like a deer and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. Waters will break forth in the wilderness, streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes, and the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Hallelujah. That's the picture that God paints for them. And, and I've tried to imagine what it must feel like. I've never been in exile. I don't know what that's like. And I've tried to imagine, what, what, what would that really feel like to be in that context and to hear that, that, that your joy is coming, that it's about to break forth, to know that you're about to experience a renewal and a restoration of your broken life that's left lying in tatters. I was thinking about the experience of um, the families and the individuals who recently were reunited as the American hostages were freed in the, in the exchange, and they were brought home to their families who had been waiting, in some cases, for years. And the experience of joy in that reunion must be indescribably profound. Or I saw this recently in a, in a video clip on a, on a news feed as it related to the experience that's happening in the Middle East right now and the hostages that have been uh, taken and some released and returned. 
And there was one that in particular just really tugged at my heartstrings. It's a little boy who with his mother and grandmother were kept in captivity by Hamas for 50 days and eventually were, was released. His name is Ohad. Watch this reunion between Ohad and his father. receiving his son, his wife, his mother back. And the image of that, that son running into the arms of his father. Gang, that's us. We are Ohad. Because we have been long held in the bondage, in the exile, in the captivity of sin and death. And Jesus has come and paid the ransom so that we can run into the arms of our Father. And be set free. And having experienced that freedom and that reunion and that restoration, how can we not be the most joyful people on the face of planet Earth? How can friends not look at us and say, man... They're so full of joy. How is that? How can we not be those kind of people? Now, does that mean we're always peppy and peachy and happy and (laughs) giddy? Do you have to be an extreme extrovert to experience joy all the time? No. And we all have bad days, right? Right? We all feel depressed or anxious sometimes. It's not always easy. In fact, life is very hard most times. It was for the Israelites. Their situation was awful. I'm I'm grateful that Isaiah hints at it, and there's other places in the scriptures that, that go into more detail about the specifics of what they were experiencing, but it was horrible. And yet in the midst of that awful context, there is the promise and the experience of joy in a profound way. They didn't have to necessarily be all peppy and energized and happy all the time. In fact, it got so bad that at one point their captors said, entertain us for a little bit. Put on a show for us. Sing us some of the songs that you used to sing back in your homeland, just to rub salt in the wound, right? Come on, play us a tune. Sing us a song, dance for us a bit. And it was so bad that they said we couldn't even find the music anymore. Listen to the words of the psalmist in Psalm 137, 1 through 4. How can we... By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows, there we hung up our lyres. For there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? We couldn't even find the music anymore. So we just hung our instruments up. And yet even in those rough, dark places, they found joy. They didn't try to manufacture it or gin themselves up or get themselves in a state of mind where they would be happy. They experienced true, authentic joy by the grace and the power of God at work in their midst. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. I hope you have. I hope you've had genuine joy in your life. Even when, perhaps especially when, 
you're in a dark season or a difficult time. I will never forget, as long as I live, one of the most profound examples I have ever seen of this from my father-in-law, Nancy's father. Many years ago, um, her mom passed away. And she and my father-in-law had been married for over 63 years. They had built a life, a beautiful life together. And in many ways, he was uh, kind of lost without her, as you might imagine. But I remember very distinctively, and it made a lasting impression upon me, as he would talk about, and he was very open, about what he was thinking and feeling in those moments. He would talk about his grief and how much he missed her. But he would also talk about all the great life and memories they shared together and how grateful he was and how truly joyful he was in the midst of his grief. And I just remember listening to that and watching him and thinking, how, how does this happen? Well, Ralph learned to experience joy in the dark seasons of his life because he came to faith later in life as an adult when after some unscrupulous business partners cheated him defrauded him and stole all of his money and he found himself in desperate straits on the verge of having to declare bankruptcy Nancy was a little girl of about fifth or sixth grade I think at that time if you ask her she'll tell you the stories of what it was like almost every night at dinner time when the sheriff would show up with yet another summons or another subpoena as the creditors were coming. And yet into Ralph's life in that season, that dark season, the Holy Spirit brought two people. His attorney, and he had a, uh, he was a very wealthy man, he had a, a private plane and a pilot that would fly him around to these sites. They, they had a fertilizer company and his pilot, both of whom were followers of Jesus. And they prayed with him and they stayed with him and they shared their heart with him. And Nancy's dad gave his life to Jesus and found true joy in one of the darkest seasons of his life. And that set the tone for the rest of his life. And you could see the transformation. You could see the fruit of the spirit of joy operative in his life in profound ways, long before Jan passed. You could see the transformation that had taken place in him. And it was remarkable. But it wasn't easy. Maybe you've experienced something along those lines, going through a difficult time or a dark season in your life, and you know what it means to have true joy and even to experience very ecstatic celebratory moments in the midst of those seasons. That's what biblical joy looks like. And so I want to I challenge you and leave you with this. Are you a person in the way that you live who daily experiences the joy of the Spirit? in you and working through you? Or are you a person who tends to complain a lot and find fault a lot and criticize a lot? What we call cantankerous or contrarian. How do the people in your family and in your workplace and in your neighborhood describe you? Do they see the fruit of the Spirit growing in you? If not, then with all the love in this pastor's heart, let me call you to repent. To turn from that spirit of criticism and complaint. To repent of that cantankerous spirit. That is not the Spirit of the Lord. And to ask Him to prune those branches that are getting in the way of you exhibiting and bearing more fruit of joy in your life.
and it's different for every one of us. Things get in the way. The weeds crop up, the thorns get in, and they rob us and steal us of joy. Amen? Amen. And we need, we can't do this on our own. This is why it's called the fruit of the Spirit, Spirit, not the fruit of effort, not the fruit of trying harder, not the fruit of willing ourselves to be happier or more joyful. It's the fruit of the Spirit working on us, working in us, pruning away the stuff that gets in the way, that robs us of our joy, that causes us to be cantankerous and contrarian. My prayer for me and for all of us is that when we walk into a room, we're the most joy-filled people in that room. So much so that people in that room will sit up and take notice and wonder if we're on something. (laughs) Like there's something so exuberant about us, so in that moment, full of joy, that it might cause them to wonder why. This is one of the things that Jesus was referring to when he said, let people see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. One of those good works is to live a life overflowing with joy. Amen? Amen. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that in just a moment. I told you we had something very special planned this morning. So hold on, let me pray for us, and then we're going to enter into a moment of extreme joy. Father, thank you that you give joy. You replace our mourning, our ashes, our brokenness with the gift of your joy that causes us to experience ecstasy and happiness and delight and fun and good times. So God, thank you for that. We pray that your Holy Spirit will work on each one of us to prune back those parts of us that are robbing us, sapping the life out of our joy fruit. Lord, whatever it may be for each one of us, we pray that you would do your divine pruning work, Lord, so that we can bear more fruit and be more joyful in our families, in our neighborhoods, our friends, our workplaces, wherever we are, Lord. May the joy of the Lord truly be our strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.